Ladies and gentlemen, could I invite you to stand for the national anthems of Jamaica and the Republic of South Africa? Sir Hilary Beckles, Vice Chancellor, University of the West Indies, Mr. Tyrone Gunny, Acting High Commissioner of the Republic of South Africa, distinguished debaters whom I will introduce at the appropriate time, visiting dignitaries, ministers of government, ministers of, uh, members of the opposition, members of the diplomatic corps, welcome all to the second staging of the Mona debates, which is this year particularly special because today marks the exact date of the 100th birthday of Nelson Mandela. <clears throat> we're truly honored that we were able to partner with the High Commission of the Republic of South Africa to hold this Freedom Week. This is the first activity that's taking place and on Friday afternoon at 5.30, there's also a panel discussion that I'll let you know about a bit later as part of the festivities. And it's interspersed with an event that the Vice Chancellor is putting on tomorrow, which is a cricket match, the Vice Chancellor's cricket match against the Bangladeshis. And we wanted to tie everything in together because we feel that there's symbolism right around. However, today is not a day for me to be talking. So I'm going to just lay out the, the order of proceedings. We're going to have a few remarks, some welcomes uh, from officials who are here. That will be followed by a special dance that I'll introduce a bit later, and then straight into the debates themselves. So I'd like to start off by inviting the Vice Chancellor, Sir Hild Reckles, to bring greetings on behalf of the University of the West Indies.
Many thanks, Dr. Mansingh. Very good, very good evening, everyone. Uh, special welcome, of course, to His Excellency. It's good to have you here. And uh, all other excellencies, distinguished members of government and civil society, students, uh, debaters, very good evening, everyone. Uh, it is, as you have heard, a very special day. A moment for us to celebrate the life of Madiba and the tremendous journey uh, of his life and his contribution uh, to the advancement of human civilization and humanity as a whole. I do recall as a student uh, engaged for the first time in international politics as a member of the Students' Anti-Apartheid Committee uh, uh, struggling uh, to free Madiba and to bring down apartheid, and critically to, to force my university campus at the time to divest all of its investments in Southern African apartheid. And for me, all of this is very personal. You'll be happy to know that your colleague students at the Cave campus are having a similar debate at this very moment at Cave Hill. And uh, this morning, there was an event uh, at the Kayfield campus in the Nelson Mandela Freedom Park. Yes, Kayfield has a Nelson Mandela Freedom Park where the students can go and relax and enjoy and reflect and to think. But welcome to this debate. Uh, the university community is enriched by all of this. I'm very excited to hear all of these uh, discursive positions uh, on all aspects of this critical theme. So enjoy the debate, and all of you, uh, please participate. The university welcomes you. Thank you. I was trying to take the easy way out and sit there. <clears throat> before I go, uh, before I introduce the next speaker, uh, the Vice Chancellor mentioned uh, the Freedom Park in, in Cave Hill and the debates that are taking place. And of course, celebrations are taking place at St. Augustine as well for, the, for, for today. But uh, I just wanted to point out that one of the visions of a former vice chancellor, uh, along with other dignitaries, I would have to say, or luminaries of this campus, was for the installation of an, insta of an inspiration park around the Faculty of Humanities. And their vision, that is uh, Rex Nettleford, Professor Barry Chavans, and Professor Ajay Mansingh, was to have an inspiration park where students can go and be inspired by world leaders who, who fought for peace and freedom. And there's supposed to be four statues that are going to be erected there. That of Mahatma Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King, and Marcus Garvey. Now, the Indian High Commission had already donated the statue of Mahatma Gandhi, and I just want to point out for those who are not aware, I had a big hand in which statue that is. That statue is a replica of the statue that stands outside Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, which Martin Luther King saw fit to have in his church. And that statue is there. What we're hoping that at the end of the Freedom Week, we may get a similar commitment from, for somebody to, to come forward with Nelson Mandela's statue. Can't imagine who that is, but I'd like to welcome <laughs> the Acting High Commissioner, His Excellency, Mr. Tyrone Gunny. And we have actually had discussions about this, and he won't talk about it now, but as time unfolds, we'll talk about that. Thank you, Dr. Mansing, for putting me on the spot. Uh, Sir Hilary Beckles, uh, the principal of the university, I understand that he is traveling. Uh, I believe there's a representative from the office of the prime minister, uh, the diplomatic corps. Ladies and gentlemen, friends all. I learned that in Jamaica, friends all. Uh, during the early hours of the morning, I started to collate my thoughts on what I would say this evening, but I got sidetracked because I started writing a tribute to cricket because of the Vice Chancellor's 11. Uh, I ultimately ended up putting together this speech for this evening, which I must grudgi grudgingly put aside based on the brevity of the other speakers. Uh, Professor Beckles, Sir Beckles, and Ladies and gentlemen, I thought long and hard about what would be fitting to say this evening about why the centenary is important and why do we celebrate the life of one among many icons in South Africa, 
Recently, we had the passing of Mama Winnie Mandela. This year, had uh, Mama Albertina Sisulu lived, she would have turned 100. And the truth is, we do celebrate their lives. But Mr. Madiba occupies a space globally. And there's a particular reason for that. Many have cast aspersions on his contribution, what were they predicated on. But we predicate our celebration on the following, that he chose a deliberate course of action in his own life. He chose a particular path to follow. As a young man in Johannesburg who had joined the African National Congress, who had led the vast majority of ordinary people to join in the struggle against apartheid. He led from the front. And leading from the front got him jailed and tortured. And in the course of that jail and torture, he taught himself to believe in the power of hope. And it was that hope and a vision for a South Africa that he believed in and wanted to lead from the front, but was willing to be the kind of leader that allowed others to occupy a space that he couldn't, that caused many of us to want to emulate the example that he set for us. That is the reason that we celebrate his contribution to the development of South African society. That is the reason that annually we call on people to give of themselves in the same way that he gave of himself to see a nation freed. And not only did he free the black people who were oppressed, by virtue of building deliberate relations with the oppressor, he assisted the oppressors to free themselves of the bondage that caused them to oppress. We are a society in transition. We are faced with the triple challenges of high inequality, high rates of poverty, and high rates of unemployment. Fundamentally, in order to transition and in order to create the society that we want, it is not beholden on our government alone to create the environment that allows for economic development. Every single one of our citizens must be the legacy. And as we seek to serve and to be the legacy in our own society, we emulate the legacy that Mr. Mandela left for us. I thank you for joining us this evening. I thank you for taking of your time to be with us. But in particular, let me take the university. My first meeting with Sir Beckles, we attempted to talk many things, but we got sidetracked by cricket. And so we followed up with the second meeting. And the origins, the genesis, lay in many discussions and widespread consultation. But most, and I must say this, most of all, it was the goodwill and affinity towards South Africa and its people that have led us to this moment. Very excited to receive my colleagues from South Africa who will be part of the debating team. And we wish you well, panelists, and we thank you all. Good evening. Thank you very much. Is this working? Yes. Um, I'd like to just pause here to play an excerpt of a speech given by, not president at that time, but leader of the ANC, Nelson Mandela, not far from here at the Assembly Hall, just across the road, in 1991. Could we get an excerpt of that speech, please? Today, Mr. Chancellor, you have not only honored me, you have honored the spirit of the thousands and millions of South Africans that apartheid sought to destroy. Those who tried to break us through many years of incarceration and unequal cruelty. One of the cruelest things that apartheid used against the black people of South Africa was to deny them education. Apartheid, in fact, went further than that. It converted education 
an instrument through which society transmits ideas, culture, history, as well as the effort of mankind to improve his living conditions into an instrument of brutal repression. We must educate the Africans, said the architects of apartheid education, so that he can understand and accept that he can only be allowed to do certain forms of labor in our society. There are green pastures on which he cannot be allowed to graze, they said. The University of the West Indies is one of the green pastures that I should not be allowed or able to graze on if the architects of apartheid had their way. Quite clearly, what we are taught was designed to create in us an irrational exaltation of the so-called great white civilization. The contributions of all peoples of color to world civilization, African, Asian, Arab, Chinese, and so on, were completely denied or distorted. Very powerful words, and I invite anybody who's not heard the speech to go to YouTube and, and um, listen to the whole eight minutes. Very, very powerful words. The last uh, welcome is from Professor Ishinkumba Kawa, Deputy Principal of the Mona Campus, representing Professor Archibald MacDonald, our host actually, who unfortunately is overseas, and I don't think was able to make it back. He was trying to get back in time, but he has sent a message through Professor Kawa, who I'm going to invite to come up and deliver it. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Chair, uh, our Vice Chancellor, uh, Your Excellency, the, uh, the High Commissioner for South Africa, uh, other uh, distinguished guests. I see, I see our um, colleague, uh, Mr. Damian. I see our former Minister of Justice. I see many, many distinguished colleagues uh, in the in the in the audience. A very warm good afternoon. I apologize on behalf of the principal who is unable to be with us this afternoon, uh, but he sends his warm greetings and I want to uh, say a few words uh, on his behalf. It is perhaps one of um, Nelson Mandela's most used quotes, but underscored by such power and truth that I'm compelled to share it on the occasion of the commemoration of B, the legacy centenary celebrations in his honor. The University of the West Indies is a testament to the fact that education is indeed the most powerful weapon against the oppression of people anywhere and a great equalizer that places all of us uh, in a position to effect the change we wish to see in the world. Friends, colleagues, and distinguished guests, all, it is my pleasure to join with you all this evening to celebrate the life, legacy, and work of a man who through his politics of personal conviction, bravery, resilience, and most importantly, his pure love for humanity, changed not only South Africa, but the, but, the, but the whole world. It is also true that Nelson Mandela was an extraordinary orator. His skill as a wordsmith and master communicator leaves us with lessons that will be studied for generations to come. If you have read his books, or had the privilege of listening to his address at the opening of his trial 54 years ago in 1964, or read his statement upon release from prison in 1990, there is an undeniable power in the use of words and language by our dear Madiba. It is most fitting that such a man, a hero, and change maker be the focus of our second annual Mona debate, which serves as one of the university's platform to, enfor to encourage productive, progressive, and inclusive dialogue meant for both the academic community and members of the public. I wish to thank our distinguished debaters, especially the team joining us from South Africa. I appreciate the effort and the work of the organizers in conceptualizing and hosting such an important calendar event. To our friends and colleagues from the South African High Commission in Jamaica, we say thanks for agreeing to partner with us 
to celebrate a global champion of human rights and justice, an advocate for dismantling all forms of oppression, and most importantly, a philanthropist and a promoter uh, of education. In closing, I wish to share another powerful quote from Nelson, Mandela, from Nelson Mandela, which I believe speaks to the true value of a healthy democracy. There are so many men and women who hold no distinctive positions, but whose contributions towards the development of the society has been enormous, end of quote. Democracy is not maintained by chance, but by our deliberate effort to create an environment where the ordinary man, woman, or child without worth, titles, or accolades, feels welcome to discuss their ideas and contribute in their own unique way to the collective peace and progress we wish to enjoy as a decent and progressive society in the world. I look forward to the stimulating debate and the discussions that will, uh, that will follow. May the best team win. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we're very much on time for the 6.30 start, except there's a very special item that we've been asked to include, which I'm really excited about. It is a, a dance by Mr. Paul Mojaji, who is visiting from South Africa. He's actually at the Edna Manley School of Dance. And this was performed as tribute when he heard of the passing of Nelson Mandela in 2013. So we have included this as a very short item before we actually get down to the debate itself, which will start in about five minutes. Uh, is Mr. Mojaji in the room? He's here. Could we get, could we get started then? I believe the first part is a, is a video tribute and then we'll come on. Mother to us all Our differences Make us who we are Land of freedom A rainbow nation is born Fight to love and die down Let who we live Mighty of all our tomb we live For every body I need so
spoken South Africa belongs to all the people who live in it Black and white, oh, the people have spoken No government can just claim authority without the people's will, yeah The people have spoken The people shall govern all national groups shall have equal rights, uh. oh, the people have spoken All equal before the law All shall enjoy the equal human rights Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Paul Mojaji. I think that sets the tone for what should be a very vibrant debate. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce first to the moot and then the debaters. Now, just to ensure safe passage home, the idea of the Mona debates was actually spawned by my wife, Dr. Gunjan Mansing, who said that we must have academic activities at the university, which is no winner, no loser, but it's just an academic exercise, and that's what this is trying to be. So our debaters have kindly consented. It doesn't mean that they're, they've known each other before, that they've collaborated. It doesn't mean that they're on the same side of the political divide or the gender divide, for that matter, or the same continent. These are four people who come with their points of view. They may not even agree with it, but they've come here to present it in an academic fashion. However, before that, I'd like to put up the moot, if we could. And the moot is, democracy has led to more fair and equitable societies. Now, think about that. Democracy has led to more fair and equitable societies. Everybody has been handed a clicker here. I'm going to ask you, after I say go, if you believe this to be true, please press the first button, which is number one, or A. If you believe it not to be true, please press the second button, which is B. So, democracy has led to more fair and equitable societies. If you agree, press A or one. If you do not agree, press B or two. Go ahead. Has everybody been collated there? Everybody press their clicker? Everybody is ink on their fingers? No. OK. Well, we're going to hear the views of four distinguished debaters who I'm going to introduce to the stage one by one. For the proposition is Ms. Kamisha Kelly, who is a consultant and works at Salisis here at the university, the Sir Arthur Institute of economic um, learning, but she herself is a debater from high school and has been on the debating scene of Jamaica and won many awards and remembers a few defeats that she still tells me about very sorely, but is one of the bright sparks of Jamaica coming up. She's also a radio co-host and a well-known personality in Jamaica. Kamisha, for the proposition. We're going to invite everybody up and then we'll talk about the, the rules. 
partnering with her in this debate only, as I said, <laughs> um, is a former minister of government who, was, who, who set the, pace, the place on fire, I think, when he was minister of government. But since he went to opposition, he set even more fires. He is, however, still a member of this university and a lecturer here, Mr. Damien Crawford. <laughs> Against the proposition, Dr. Sonia Stanley Naya, who is the director of the Institute of Caribbean Studies here at the University of the West Indies, and a very, very well-known personality, uh, known to be eloquent, well-spoken, and is apparently making her debut as a debater. But I don't think that will hold her back one way. Dr. Naya. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce from the Institute of Global Dialogue at the University of South Africa. Now, I will point out that when we put together this Freedom Week con uh, concept, the, the, the High Commission of South Africa very readily said that they'll bring a delegation from the University of South Africa. Professor Filani and Tembo arrived in Jamaica about an hour ago, straight from Johannesburg. They went from Johannesburg, Sao Paulo, to Panama, to Kingston, to get here for this debate. There are two other members, I'm not too sure if they've arrived as yet, from the University of South Africa. I have, are our delegates here? They are en route from Montego Bay as we speak, coming straight in from, from South Africa. Their flight was a bit delayed, and we're hoping that they'll join us shortly. But Professor Ntembo, warm welcome to Jamaica, sir. So the debate has a very straightforward format. Ten minutes per presenter. We start with a, pre with a presenter chosen, and that's going to be Damon Crawford on for, for the proposition, followed by ten minutes against the proposition, ten minutes for the proposition again, ten minutes again, uh, against. Once that is finished, there will be five-minute rebuttals. And then at the end of that, we'll tell you of the other activities. However, I have the simplest job because my job is to sit back here and listen and just count the minutes. My job is to ensure that 10 minutes it is. So we will start uh, with talking for the proposition, Mr. Damon Crawford, and your time starts now. Thank you very much, Thank you very much Mr. Moderator. I want to say a special good afternoon, of course, to Sir Hilary Beckles, the Vice Chancellor at the University of the West Indies. Uh, Professor Cole, colleague and vice principal at the University of the West Indies. As well, special good afternoon to. Thank you. Special good afternoon to uh, Sir Tyrone Gunnings from the um, South African Embassy, uh, other members of the diplomatic corps, my colleague as well, um, Senator Mark Golding, and others in the audience other debaters, and of course, my partner. Bob Marley has a song called War, which says, until the philosophy that holds one race superior and another inferior is finally and permanently eradicated, there'll be war. And until there's no first and class, second class, or second class citizen of any nation, there'll be war. And that has led me to many conversations with myself and thinking on the topic. Why is it that Haile Selassie initially and Bob Marley in his song suggested that until there is no inequity, there will be war? And I came to the conclusion that there would be war because those who have privilege will fight to maintain privilege, and those who don't have privilege will fight to attain privilege. Those who have it will fight to keep it, and those who don't have it will fight to get it. One battlefield for this fight is governance. And so therefore, the conversation is about the options in governance. And those options are monarchy, ruled by one, democracy, power of the people, and oligarchy, ruled by a few. The question therefore is, has democracy led to a more free and equitable society as versus monarchy and oligarchy? Indeed. The question is not, had democracy led to a free society, or has democracy led to an equitable society, but indeed, had it led to a more, not in the absolute, but in the relative, have it led to a more free and a more equitable. 
It means, therefore, if democracy has led to 2% equity, then it others might have led to 1% equity. The conversation, therefore, is not in the absolute. By its design, democracy actually is supposed to achieve the move. Inside, in fact, Sheev and Salvage suggest that democracy more likely is more likely to implement policies that reduces, in particular, wealth inequality, because those with little wealth are more numerous and therefore has more votes. It suggests, therefore, that as Nelson Mandela himself said, that democracy is a majority principle. To this extent, we'd like to look at the two concepts to our discussion. The first is freedom. There are three types of freedom. The first, the freedom to dream, which is God-given. The second, the freedom to be, which is God-desired. And the third, the freedom to achieve, which is God-pleasing. Note, the freedom to dream will have very little disparity as it's God-given and no one can take away what is given by God. And so all persons, be it in a democracy, an oligarchy, or a monarchy, will have the ability to dream. I put it to you that I'm sure many persons in an oligarchy or in a monarchy are dreaming to this day of a democracy. The freedom to be, however, is God desired and can be taken away. The realities of slavery was proof that the freedom to be was not allowed automatically. In fact, what happened in South Africa is also proof that the freedom to be is not an automatic. However, some of the examples of a freedom to be are religion, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly. It is no question that democracy has allowed for these freedoms more so than the monarchy or an oligarchy. Indeed, the freedom of religion is clearly a principle of democratic freedom. The freedom of the press is a principle of democratic freedom. The freedom of speech and the freedom of assembly, in particular the ability to demonstrate, is indeed a democratic principle, a democratic freedom. It is therefore without doubt that we support the, 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 the moot, that democracy has led in particular to a greater freedom to be. The third is the freedom to achieve. A freedom to have one's ambitions and one's talent to take them to wherever it is necessary for them or wherever it is possible for them to achieve. This freedom to achieve is also without question a greater presence in democratic nations than it is in non-democratic nations. We move now to the concept of equality. And this, I put to you, Mr. Chairman, is more difficult to define. Indeed, one ought to suggest that we are incapable to define equality because we have never achieved it in this world. To that extent, what we are looking at is a definition from Webster which suggests that equality is the concept of fairness or justice in how people are treated. It expands much further to a debate about equity as versus equality. Is there a need for all persons to receive the same, or is there a need for persons without to receive more than persons that are with? Not just income equity, as it is that most persons will suggest that there is a high level of inequity, and some authors have also suggested that there is no proof that democratic nations have caused for greater equity in income. Some have also said that they have not caused for greater equity in wealth. However, we will all agree that equal pay for women don't mean equality of women. And so therefore, the concept of equality is not only about income, but one can easily agree that those persons within a democratic society are more likely to be treated fairly and justly than those persons not in a democratic society. It's important at this point to let you in on a often Repeated statement that is seldom known to be untrue. It says, men lie, women lie, but numbers don't. This is one occasion that numbers will say that there is no correlation between the democratic process and equity. However, the focus only on income, and income consumption, and wealth equity is a misnomer in the least. The question, therefore, is that, sorry, it is therefore important for me to point out that if democracy, which is intended to achieve fairness, to achieve equity, has not, we must agree that a war is not fought on a single front. In fact, you would have known of many battles within a war.
And so on the front of governance, democracy wins. The question, therefore, is if democracy has not been allowed to create sufficient fairness and sufficient equity, what might be the hindrances of democracy creating that reality? The first is that does democracy really exist in the places that propose that they're democratic nations? If we should use the definition put forward by Prezwarik um, in 2000, that the presence of election with more than one party um, is the basis of democracy, then many, de many nations suggesting to be democratic are indeed democratic. However, if we look at the, the, the origin of the word democracy in the Greek format, which means power to the people, many nations with elections are not indeed democratic. In fact, some authors have spoken to democratic crap capture by those who are of the upper echelons of society. Some authors have also spoken about democratic exit, about the number of persons who participate in the democratic process. It means, therefore, that we are more of an oligarchy, and in some cases a monarchy, in places that we suggest to be democratic. The second is that there are divided societies along lines more than just privilege and underprivilege. There are divides along religion, there are divides along geographic spaces, and by extension, the coordinated effort of the political process has not been brought to bear upon the achievement of equity because of the disappropriate, disappropriate distribution of the privilege as versus the underprivilege. And finally, the culture of fairness in our society would suggest that not many will fight for fairness when they believe that unfairness is actually correct. Indeed, many of us believe it is right for the owners of capital to earn much more returns than the owners of labor and find no difficulty with the wealth of the owner as versus the poverty of the worker. To this extent, the principles of democracy have not been brought to bear upon an issue which have not been identified for the inequity within our society. With this, Mr. Chairman, I thank you. I saw a lot of heads nodding there in approval. Uh, at this point, I just want to welcome all the viewers on UETV and to point out that this is being streamed throughout the world and will be available at the UETV site for, for further view in the future. Uh, while we prepare for the first speaker, against, the, um, against the, the moot, I'd just like to recognize the presence of the Deputy Principal Designate for the Mona Campus, Professor Ian Boxill, who has joined us for this <laughs> debate. Dr. Sonia Nayo. Ah, there we go. Good evening, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, Professor Kawa, distinguished ambassador, colleagues, distinguished friends, all. I stand here on the backs of those from Jamaica, South Africa, and elsewhere who have ever fought for freedom. Liberty reaching with her torch of flames. Yes, the eyes of liberty is watching you. To yourself, you must be true. The eyes of justice is crying out. What is democracy all about? These lines are taken from Muta Baruka's Eyes of Liberty, in which he questions the kind of democracy practiced in the West. Like Muta Baruka, many have questioned the proponents of democracy and the degree to which it shouldn't be called democracy. When I was a teenager, any thought of democracy was linked to the idea of elections, general elections, free and fair elections, all free, all fair. But colleagues, I submit to you today that my politically inept teenage brain thankfully gave way to more nuanced definitions of democracy and more significantly, personal contemplations beyond academic discourse. According to Woodruff in First Democracy, democracy can be seen through seven key ideas. And these are some of the things my, my distinguished opponent didn't, didn't share with you. Freedom from tyranny, harmony, the rule of law, natural equality, citizen wisdom, reasoning with, with knowledge, and general education. While many democracies or democratic societies are defined by the existence of free and fair or equitable elections, 
This activity of selecting government leaders is insufficient in determining the success or effectiveness of democracy, especially in places where there is a lack of universal suffrage. The process of voting can and has been tampered with or influenced through clientelism, coercion, and scare tactics, and is only a reflection of majority or mob rule, arguably. Elected governments can and have been deposed, and Aristide of Haiti is an example very close to home. Essentially, equality does not exist. It is strongly militated against by xenophobia, ultranationalism, and special treatment given to some groups, and lest we forget, there is white privilege resulting in various human rights violations. But let's dig a, a bit deeper into violation of human rights. As was seen in Orwell's Big Brother, totalitarianism has prevailed through massive surveillance, examples of which can be seen in the Patriot Act. With the advent of big data, privacy is invaded as corporations sell and buy personal information of consumers without their knowledge or permission. Special groups are targeted based on their preferences to support particular government programs and elections. Freedom of movement gets restricted during things such as states of emergency. Although no one can tell you what to think, certain ideologies are promoted more than others. Most societies are patriarchal, and women are still treated as second-class citizens in many aspects, with the proverbial glass ceiling still unattainable. Limited freedom of expression is also a reality for many. Persons still experience discrimination based on their religious beliefs and practices, with relevant contemporary examples being Islam and Rastafari. I share with you some cases. South Africa before democracy. Under apartheid, the laws of South Africa favored white dominance where access and ownership of land, labor, education, and resources were in their favor. A system of injustice and abuse of human rights prevailed. South Africa after democracy. In the name of democracy, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission was set up to act as a mechanism in the post-apartheid era to foster dialogue and repair with reparations as the main form of recompense for victims who suffered under apartheid. However, the transference of power that occurred in the country in the early 1990s was part of a negotiated settlement that allowed for a political transition whilst leaving the economic wealth still firmly in the grips of white South Africans. As apartheid was dismantled, it was hoped that the inequalities that it had legislated into being over decades would begin to be addressed. As Sizwe Mpofu Walsh shared in the Mandela debate, reconciliation or conciliation, a democratic objective, allowed a politics of spectacle to overturn an actual tangible cry for justice. It was thought that the Mandela government went too far in replacing ambitious, redistributive change along the lines of gender and race, resulting in a politics of spectacle, which was ultimately hollow. A politics of spectacle overtook the issue of conciliation. In the case number two, Iraq before democracy. Seen as a dictatorship under Saddam Hussein, where male domination of women manifested inequality, and lack of access to resources of women, by women, a history of oppression and violence among ethnic groups, generally seen as a war zone for, for religionists in the region. But what does Iraq look like after democracy? For many Iraqis, equality before the law, due process, personal freedoms, property rights, etc., remain an unattainable objective today, as they were under Saddam Hussein. Women are still subservient, with the ban on being allowed to drive only lifted in 2018. The only way a stable democracy seemingly exists is with the presence of a U.S. military, which, is, which in essence nullifies the idea of democracy 
and is akin to a dictatorship, which is what they were trying to escape originally. Plus c'est change, plus c'est Paris. Case three, closer to home. We can look at Jamaica before democracy, the colonial state. This was a colonized state ruled by Great Britain where blacks brought across the Atlantic were enslaved. Originally, the franchise to vote in Jamaica as in other British colonies was ownership of freeholds of a specific value or the payment of taxes above a certain amount. However, the franchise was restricted to white males aged 21 and older. What does Jamaica look like after democracy? In 1830, free colored and black men were granted the right to vote, followed by Jewish men in 1831. Jamaica was granted full adult suffrage on November 20th, 1944. Prior to that, the right to vote was determined by the amount of wealth or property a man held, and women were not allowed to vote. The new system extended voting rights to adults, irrespective of their race, sex, or social class. Since the 1940s, Jamaica's democracy has still left some disenfranchised and without ties to the nation from which they seek daily sustenance. Indeed, we are back to the days of states of emergency because of the inability to curb complex outbreaks of violence across the island as people scramble for scarce economic resources and social capital. Democracy, therefore, my colleagues, has challenges. And what my opponents will not share with you is that we are now in a democracy of dy dystopia. This brand of democracy was mentioned in the Observer newspaper recently when it was discovered that USA billionaire Robert Mercer personally directed his data analytics firm to offer Brexit support to Nigel Farage information for targeted ad campaigns to particular Facebook users in order to sway them towards supporting a yes vote on Brexit. In the now infamous aftermath of a shocking yes majority that approved the UK separation from the European Union, it appears that Mercer's decision to use his big data company and finances to influence British democracy worked. This is reminiscent of Huxley's Brave New World, where persons' obsession and adoration of technology caused them to surrender their privacy and even freedom to think. But it gets even worse. There is a decline in democracy internationally. And I will share more on that as I rebut. Thank you. What's, firstly, I can't believe it's a debut performance. Secondly, what's amazing, the same ones who were shaking their heads 10 minutes ago were shaking their heads again in the last 10 minutes. I hand over to Kamisha Kelly, a well-seasoned debater, for the second um, of the four proposition for the moot. Thank you very much, and I, I suspect that round of applause is from some of the members of the Jamaica Association for Debating and Empowerment. And we, I can say, are young people who believe in democracy. And you know, I enjoyed listening to the presentation from Dr. Sonia Stanley Nyer. There's a lot that I learned because I'm always open to learning. And I appreciated the challenge that she threw out to us as the proposition. But there are several things I'd like to put to the opposing team. The question is that, has democracy led to a more free and equitable society? Has it led to more free and equitable societies? And my colleague Damien Crawford has already, you know, responded, presented the perspective that when we talk about more free and equitable, that is a comparative, and that point was not at all touched by the opposing team. I want to also point out that democracy Yes, it is challenged. It is being challenged in this day and age. And I will speak some more on that. But up front, I want to say the absence or failure to attain certain goals, certain ideals outlined in the principles of democracy must not be confused with democracy failing overall. Yes, we have challenges. And yes, we are not where we should be. 
There are areas where we have fallen down, and as you rightly pointed out, in many spaces we see rising inequality. Is rising inequality a failure of democracy itself, its principles and tenets, or a failure of leadership? A failure of capitalism, some might argue. A failure of econo economic systems and leaders who have not been committed and been so espoused to the principles of democracy to make all citizens economically equal. Is that a failure of democracy, really? Now, we are not looking towards a perfect state because globally we cannot identify any such thing. We have no model that is perfect. What we have to do is to keep finding the things that will drive forward the principle of democracy. And I agree on the points you mentioned about equity. When we're talking about equity, we're thinking about human rights. We're thinking about protecting children. We're thinking about addressing income inequality. We're thinking about the environment. See, we're thinking about all the global indices that would demonstrate an equitable society. But the reality is this. Oligarchy, monarchy, authoritarianism, democracy. Democracy is the door that best opens up the possibility of achieving all these objectives we want, the objectives of a more equitable world, of more equitable societies, of freer states for everyone. You see, opponents, you must prove that the tenets of democracy are fundamentally flawed in the quest to achieve this equity and the respect for human rights we continue to be a work in progress. Nothing at all is ever going to be ideal, and we must accept that. We are different. We can, however, commit to a willingness to always try, to always assess, and to always improve. Now, what achievements would, we, would not have happened without democracy? Spend some time to think about that international cooperation on some of the important indices for a more free and equitable world. International cooperation on human rights. We talk about trade. And it's interesting that trade has been, been facilitated because of our democracies. And then when we look within our countries, there is a failing because of what? Leadership, not democracy. Democracy has also facilitated more peace talks. And believe it or not, Free to be, we indeed live in a more peaceful world than ever before. I have a question for everyone here, and including side opposition. If not democracy, then what? If not democracy, then what? Because we can sit here and talk about all the problems that we are facing, but give me an alternative. Give me a better way. To say no to democracy and what it can achieve is to break the jaw of humanity. It is to alienate human rights. It is to alienate the voice of every single person. You see, Jamaica, where I live, and I'm proud to be a Jamaican, is a small island. And no small island is really existing without democracy. Because as we grow, we have become more interdependent. And if we become more interdependent, the global indices are often requiring us to be democracies to, to participate in global conversations. To, to, to argue, therefore, against democracy is to say that we, a small island, have no place in the global society, in a modern society. In truth and in fact, when we continue to assess, we recognize that because of democracy and the corporations that we have, uh, globalization is even erasing the concept of brain drain because it means that I, as a young person in Jamaica, can connect anywhere and work anywhere with different persons. So let's answer this. The quest for a better democracy is an important part of the question that was not added, but we must look at it. It will require a greater level of will, commi commitment, and education to drive policy. It will, it will require increasing accountability. It will require policy shaped by constant, inclusive research. It will require a system of measurement and outcome assessments. See, the base of democracy is that the individual is sovereign. And when indiv individual voices are combined with others, that moves society forward. So we talk about the quest to address human rights and so on. I want to say this. Democracy is a constant attempt to get it right. While other forms of government, like communism, like 
authoritarianism, they are pretty static. At least we are moving, a li- we're moving the needle a little further every time we try to improve democracy. Barack Obama calls it the quest for a more equal union. And we bend the arc of justice. We bend the arc of a better democracy every day that we continue to try. Democracy creates a forum for the exchange of different ideas without the violence. And look, the reality is, as we try to create a more equal Jamaica, a more equitable Jamaica, because of our democracy, we can, cha- we can share the ideas. We can show how other spaces and places have improved. And then we move a little further. If we look at the crooks of democracy, that conversation, that speaking with and giving respect to every other voice, even if I do not agree, that for me means that I am making Jamaica a little better because I'm understanding differences a little better. It means I can therefore advocate for a brother and a sister to be as safe and as free as I am in my very own Jamaica. Democracy, yes, it is based on the majority principle. And this is, and I'm going to quote now from Nelson Mandela, democracy is based on the majority principle. This is especially true in a country such as South Africa, where the vast majority has been systematically denied their rights. At the same time, democracy also requires that the rights of political and other minorities are safeguarded. Democracy enables us to do and pursue that kind of uh, safeguarding. The opposition can rightly tell us how the moneyed class has often had their voice amplified. And this underscores the importance of education and civic organizations so that other voices can indeed be amplified. Democracy, in truth, has become enfeebled largely because companies in intensifying competition for global consumers and investors have invested ever greater sums in lobbying, public relations, and even bribes and kickbacks because democracy is fraught with corruption at many points. However, we have to seek laws that prohibit these things because what we have is an arms race for political influence that is drowning out the voice of the average citizens. And I would not hope, I would hope no one is going to present to us the United States as a true democracy because we know that there are voices that are greater than others even in their election system. But in the Commonwealth, it's a little different. Now, Barack Obama delivering, how much time am I? Okay, fine, I'm at the two minutes mark, good. Barack Obama delivering the Mandela Lecture yesterday noted that there has been a reversal of the gains of freedom and democracy that swept the globe at the time of former President Nelson Mandela from when he was freed from prison and when the Berlin Wall came crashing down. Obama said the democratic and economic gains that were achieved in the years that followed Mandela's release from prison in 1990 were slowly being erased Listen by what? By authoritarian regimes that do not respect human rights and by global corporates that put profits before people. Is this then a failure of democracy? When it's been under, the gains are being undermined by authoritarian regi- regimes? Much for us to think about. And another quote from Obama, he says, An entire generation has grown up in a world that has not gotten steadily freer, wealthier, less violent, and more tolerant during the course of their lives. That's the generation I'm a part of. It should make us hopeful, but if we can't deny, but we can't deny the real strides our world has made since that moment when Madiba took steps out of confinement, we have to recognize ways in which the international order has fallen short of its promises. So, of course, our international democracy is not perfect. Because of the failure of governments, powerful elites, we now see much of the world return to an older, more dangerous, more brutal way of doing business. I want to share, political freedom is no guarantee for economic freedom. It requires leaders who are so espoused to the principles of democracy that they take great efforts to address income inequality and advance social welfare. Improving governance, that is the key to ensuring free, fair, and equitable societies, and that must take place within the construct of democracy. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And I'm going to warn you, your heads are going to soon drop off. eh? (laughs) The amount of nodding that I'm seeing there. Professor Filani and Thembo. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, It's a great pleasure uh, to address you. Um, The key, I think the key challenge and the key problem with this uh, topic when we talk about governance 
is that we have become so caught up in very new ideas and concepts of governance which largely have a Western uh, grounding and are largely rooted in the evolution and the development of Western societies. And therefore, when we talk about democracy, we often imagine the democracies of Europe, we imagine the United States, and so forth. And we say that is, uh, you know, that is democracy. Uh, look what democracy has delivered. We look at the, um, the fact that Europe is a prosperous continent, largely Western Europe. But we don't ask ourselves, did these societies just spring out of nowhere? Did these societies just emerge suddenly as modern democracies? The answer is no. These societies evolved over time. They evolved systems of governance. And what's important is that in all of these societies, the systems of governance adapted to their particular conditions, adapted to their particular demands at those particular times. They became democratic in the modern sense of democracy over time, right? So this is the, the first thing that I would like you know, to put out there. Let's move away from the idea that we only have three forms of governance, that we have a monarchy, that we have a democracy, and that we have an oligarchy. Human societies are filled with examples of systems that cannot be grouped under those categories. And evidence shows that those societies actually thrived and were prosperous and were more equitable and did deliver more justice than the societies that we are building today under what we now call democracy, right? So when you have these missions to democratize and to, and to bring about development, which sound very similar to the old missionary uh, type um, uh, uh, conquests, we need to pause a bit and say, hold on, in the societies that we are promoting democracies, how did these societies live before that? Were they democratic? Were they oligarchies? Were they monarchies? Well, let's look for instance. We had in parts of East Africa, for many years, about 700 years, kingdoms ruled only by women. Only women. Um, for about 700 years, Queen Makeda of Sheba, we have uh, the Songhai Empire, which was the last of three major pre-colonial empires to emerge in West Africa. West Africa, which has many examples of where women actually lead societies. But let's look at our modern societies. How many societies can we point to that actually have such examples? Now, in the form of the Songhai Empire, let's say 1375, until around 1591. Um, it enjoyed a period of peace and prosperity, traded with its neighbors, traded with the rest of the world. Um, its inhabitants, you know, you had urban centers that flourished, uh, such as Gao, where the vast majority of its inhabitants were small farmers, uh, whose actually fortunes were tied to the success in agriculture rather than commerce. Um, you also have in the 14th and the 15th century in Central Africa, kingdoms that arose to prominence, um, such as the Luba dynasty. Uh, these empires located in southern savannah between the Kasai um, and the Lualaba rivers in what's present day the Democratic Republic of Congo. Now they stretch to present Zambia and Angola. And in these societies, you had good governance. In fact, the very idea of governance rotated around principles of justice, moral character, and compassion. These were equated with civilization. So leadership was equated upon those particular principles and the exercise of those principles. Now the Luba, they focused on hunting and agriculture. 
you didn't have, uh, uh, you know, poverty in those societies, mass inequality, and so forth. They grew cassava, sorghum, and milled and reared livestock, right? You had, you didn't have mass inequality in those societies. Now, you also had other forms of societies um, on the African continent, which blended systems of a more centralized form of governance with bottom-up governance, right? So, for instance, the Nua in Sudan, or the Konkomba in Ghana and Togo, uh, the middle spectrum of these societies, you know, you had basically chiefdoms. And in any decision-making that had to be made, you see, the idea today, we look at a chief or a king, but we think of a, a European king and a European chief. We don't understand that actually chiefdomship in those societies meant that the chief really does convey the wishes of the people and that when the chief speaks, it's because that has gone through various village councils and by the time the chief actually speaks, he or she actually does speak on behalf of the people because of the various consultation processes that have happened. In southern Africa, you have the concepts of lichutla, a gathering from the Sutu and the Tswana, where essentially meetings take place around the villages, where the highest in the society sits with those who are considered maybe in what we might call the lowest in the societies. But they all sit in the same place and they discuss issues of the day. They discuss their challenges, they discuss their future. They make collective decisions, right? Now, these are forms of governance that existed and we have evidence of how they thrived. You have in Southern Africa also the Queen Mojaji, who, and, 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 and further to that, you have, um, other, you have the, the, the Lovedu tribe, the Balubedu, who also, leadership is actually through the females. Now, these societies are there, but it's ironic that when we speak today about how these societies need to be democratized, we speak and we box them into a particular form of democracy, which largely originated from the West. And why does it not work in these societies? It doesn't work because the forms of governance in those societies are imposed from the outside through political pressure, sometimes military pressure. The societies are not allowed to evolve endogenous systems of governance that meet their own demands and their own criteria. And this is what we should be moving towards. What works, and history tells us that what works in societies is not a one-fit, a one-size-fits-all in each society. What works is when the leadership in those societies is legitimate, is when it's born from the needs of the people. So the problem is when we when we obsess about the concept itself, democracy, is that we obsess about a particular form of democracy. Taken on its pure definition, democracy did not come from Greece. The concept might have come, yes, dem demos, and yes, sure, but the practice and the ideas of inclusive governance, of consultation, of collective decision making, of legitimacy in the process, it pre-exists colonial times. These ideas have been there, they have been practiced in the societies, but differently. It might not have been an election every five years, but consultations were taking place consistently in those societies, shaping the decisions of those societies. And therefore, what we need to move towards and what will really bring equality 
and justice is endogenous systems of governance. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we heard four phenomenal presentations from our debaters. We're now going to afford them five minutes each as a period of rebuttal, starting from the team on my right. They can choose whoever goes first, and then five to the left, five to the right, and five to the left. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I've been tasked once again to go first. Mm -hmm. And in going first, I have to bring to light one of the conversations I was having with my teammate and later with myself about the difference between the origin of the words democracy, oligarchy, and uh, monarchy. Indeed, the term monarchy suggested rule by one. The term oligarchy suggested rule by a few. However, the term democracy suggested power of the people. It didn't suggest rule, but in this case, power. And so, a quick Google search in a democratic society allowed for me to find that power is the capacity or ability to direct or influence the behavior of others or the course of events. Now, what my esteemed uh, colleague have been highlighting was the ability, the capacity to direct or influence the behavior of others and the course of events. So what he really was suggesting was that there was in another form power of the people. He suggested, therefore, that democracy existed. The misunderstanding that an election every four years, every five years, every term limit, is not based on what democracy is. It is not based on my imagination of the United States or England. It is based on the term that defines it, power of the people. And so whatever source, whatever form, whatever methodology it is used to achieve power of the people is indeed democracy. So we would have been at a difficult position had the moot been, is Greece the mother of democracy? Maybe not. We'd have been in a difficult position if we said, have democracy been bastardized? Yes, I made that clear. It has been captured by the wealthy. It has been avoided by the, 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 the majority. We have voter turnouts even in Jamaica, less than 50%. So therefore, it has been bastardized. The moot, however, says that democracy allows for, democracy um, has led to more free and fair um, so, and equitable societies. Let's look at some examples given. Iraq before democracy. Iraq after democracy have been able to set up the national network of, um, to combat violence against women, by women. That wasn't allowed before democracy. Let's look at Jamaica before democracy. Jamaica before democracy had poverty rates above 30%. Jamaica after democracy had poverty rates as low at one point of 10% and more recently, 17%. Let's look at many other places, because what we have identified is that there were intervening forces between a democratic Africa and an Africa that now finds it difficult to implement new forms of democracy. And that imposition has caused for some of the learnings to be unlearned about how democratic those original places were, led by women, led by men. And so we have taken on some of the negatives of the atrocities of the colonial period that has caused for people to be less capable to deliver upon the promises of the democratic processes. However, my esteemed colleague suggested that there were four, f there are seven um, variables to be considered, and then went on to suggest that the democracies that she is discussing had none or few of the seven. Those places that have freedom of the press, freedom of movement, freedom of religion, freedom of association, have proven disproportionately to be more fair for women and men, for children and adults, for persons of different, diff different religious dispensations, and have proven to be equitable, not only, more equitable, I'm sorry, not only in, the com co in income, not only in wealth, not only in consumption, but equitable in opportunities for persons to be free to be 
to be free to achieve and to achieve all the dreams that they were free to dream. Thank you. Against the proposition. What my fellow opponents haven't told you in their optimistic fervor is that democracy internationally is declining. Why is this? Why are gains being undermined by authoritarian regimes? Why are the principles of democracy, past and present, eluding them? And we could call names of presidents, of dictators, of countries. We could call, we could talk about the Philippines, we could talk about Turkey. I submit there is perceived a certain futility of trying. A futility in democracy to create systems for broad, equal participation. My opponent has outlined all the various platforms for the basis of inequality. Ms. Kelly, indeed, the illusion of hope from democracy, the dystopia of democracy. More than half the countries in the latest update of a democratic health index saw their scores decline. These are countries in which power to the people is declining. Less than 5% of the world's population currently lives in a full democracy. Nearly one third live under authoritarian rule with a large share of those in China. Overall, 89 of 167 countries assessed in 2017, not 1940, received lower scores than they did the year before. The Spanish government attempt to stop a referendum in Catalonia caused their points to fall by 0.22. In Malta, the unresolved murder of Daphne Caruna Galizia, an anti-corruption blogger, questioned the rule of law and willingness by authorities to investigate crimes dropping the points for Malta to 0 0.24, by 0 0.24 points. The decline in democracy, my colleagues, is therefore palpable. France, already a flawed democracy, fell further down the table. The most notable decline occurred in Indonesia, falling from 48th to 68th place. Venezuela's score dropped in the authoritarian regime category. USA sits in 21st place, leveling with Italy, a flawed democracy for the second year in a row. South Korea, which was previously colored as a full democracy, is now an entry corrected as a flawed democracy. In closing, a society must have in place or intend to build institutions that allow its citizens on a daily basis to participate in all aspects of the political process. A democratic society must guarantee that all people are equal before the law. That in turn demands an independent and apolitical judiciary. A true democracy acknowledges and respects all cultural, ethnic, or religious differences that may exist within its borders and freedom of opinion without fearing repercussions from those who have been elected is most critical. Free and fair elections are a necessary but not sufficient condition of democracy. Enthusiastic and unquestioned support of elections without the necessary groundwork can lead to failed societies and we are, we are seeing some of those. Democracy serves the interests of the hegemonic sectors of the society and the owners of the means of production for whom promises of equality can never be satisfactory or even realized for the masses. Has democracy led to more free and equitable societies? Friends, colleagues, my opponents, I submit to you, I have shared with you that with the decline of democracy globally, there is no way that the answer to the moot can be yes. Thank you. Aware and informed about the past, aware of our challenges, 
or successes and failures, all of which have helped to shape my conceptualization of democracy, all, have we, all of which have helped to shape the world and my conception of it. I am not old enough to be jaded by the failings of democracy, but I am still young enough to make a big difference on creating a better democracy. See, my opponent presented certain things that I had already touched on. She highlighted flawed democracies, but I'm pleased that at the beginning I was very clear that there is no perfect democracy. There is none that can be held up as the best practice for every single person. Our colleague from South Africa learned a lot from him as well and appreciated very much his presentation. But at the end of the day, there is agreement on this. There must be different forms. And we never prescribed the form that democracy ought to take. We know that it involves inclusive free and fair elections, at least. We also highlighted that it is important for it to have equal weight given to the voices, especially the voices of the minorities in any society. So I want to also highlight that I loved, and I always love hearing of the examples of the fantastic women leaders who are my ancestors. And I accept and earlier submitted that women are considered the minority in our democracies as well. And women's voices have not gone to the fore of many democracies around the world. There is no challenge on that. But like democracy is a work in progress, so too achieving equal access for women, achieving equity for women is a work in progress. And I'm pleased that as we learn about the queens and empresses who were phenomenal leaders all over the African continent, I and many women leaders around the world can continue to be inspired by what is possible when women do, an, do, do, do one thing. When women use their democratic right and come together to amplify our voices. And that is when we will get the respect that is when we will get higher in the democratic space. So democracy is about each voice being sovereign and pulling those voices together to champion causes and move society forward. So I'm pleased to see many women in leadership, many of who are here today, and many of who I suspect and submit would rather live in a democracy than an oligarchy, a monarchy, or an autocratic state. The reality is, and let me stay on this point of women's rights a little bit more, it is our global democracy that has been helping to champion the rights of women, not only in Western democratic states, but women, after all, around the world. And if there's one thing I can be grateful for democracy for, it probably is that fact. Now, we, I suspect that the argument about how states have come to be democratized is outside the remit of this debate. Because I submit we're asking and answering the question about whether or not democracy has made the world freer and more equitable. We have said that gains the gains from democracy, not the gains of states just existing, the gains from a democracy are being eroded right now and I identified why. And I also gave you some suggestions for recourse. We cannot sit by and allow a few strong men to append the work that has been done by democracy, the gains that have been achieved by democracy. If people sit back and do nothing, that is what happens. Democracy requires everyone's active participation, everyone coming together to amplify their voices, the voices of every minority, the voices of every perspective, however divergent the status quo may make it seem. And it is in conversation, in advocacy, and in lobbying that we share perspective, we share the ways that we continue to create a freer and more equitable world. Thank you. Colleagues, um, what we are all interested in 
is the creation of more just and equitable societies. That is what we are interested in. We are not boxing ourselves in to say this is the only way you can create more just and equitable societies, right? So this is the key thing. And here I need to quote, uh, who put it quite, quite clearly, a uh, former Chinese uh, leader who said, um, white cat, black cat, if it catches the mouse, it's a good cat. Now, now the reason I say this is because whatever system, in whatever context, in whatever society managed, manages to create a more just society, then that is the system that must work for that society. Right? It's not that there's a one-size-fits-all for all societies to emulate. We speak about democracy achieving gains, um, but you know, you talk about, for instance, the Millennium Development Goals, uh, which were adopted from the year 2000 until 2015. We know empirically that had it not been um, for, you know, for China essentially uh, alleviating more, more than 300 um, million uh, people out of, uh, out of poverty, the world would not have reached the MDGs. So, is China a democracy? No. We talk about developmental states, right? The Koreas uh, of this world, um, your Singapores, and so forth. As these societies when they alleviated poverty, they did not do that within what we now call a democratic country. They simply implemented their own systems in their own times. And then over time, the societies opened up. Why? Because society demanded that. Society demanded, it said, we are getting more prosperous. We are building the infrastructure. We are doing this, and our expectations are rising. Now we want this. But the difference there is that it comes from within those societies. And the timing is driven by the needs and the demands of those societies. So to end off, what we are interested in is the creation of just and equitable societies. We understand there's diversity in the world. In Africa alone, there's over 2,000 languages and cultures, right? It's a huge continent which fits the United States, Europe, China, India, um, Australia. All of that fits into the African continent. Huge, diverse continent. Now you could imagine that in such diversity you would have diverse systems of governance. The problem that we come from in the post-1990 where we had a unipolar moment where the United States was dominant and with its, 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 its allies, you had a moment where they thought that their success is because of their democratic systems and therefore they must pass that on to everyone. That was a mistake because in the societies they tried to do that, the societies went backwards. They didn't go forward, they went backwards. Successful systems of governance and, and, and successful systems of leadership and successful societies that are equitable and that are just are driven by their own demands, their own systems. They are not 
concerned with naming it this or that, a democracy or that. Even the developmental states, when they were developing, they did not call themselves developmental states. Only afterwards, scholars call them developmental states. So let's focus on that. White cat, black cat, if it catches the mouse, it's a good cat. Ladies and gentlemen, you have heard some compelling discussions in this debate. I'm going to ask once again for our AV people to put up the moot. I'm going to ask you to take your clicker again. If you believe that you're still for the moot that democracy has led to more free and equitable societies, please press 1. If you do not believe that, please press 2. Go ahead now. And at the end of that exercise, we're going to have some collations to show you what you thought before the debate and what you thought after the debate. But whatever you thought, one thing I think we can all agree upon is that we had a very high quality, highly intellectual, very well executed debate by all our four debaters. I'd like to give them a round of applause. As I'd mentioned, this is part of Freedom Week. And on Friday at 5.30 in the N1 Lecture Theatre, there's a panel discussion on the ugly past, democracy, sorry, independence, stroke, reconciliation, and the future. Parallels between South Africa and Jamaica. Our other panelists from the University of South Africa will join panelists at UWI at the N1 Lecture Theatre 5.30 on Friday to continue the discussion. That's where everybody will have a chance to speak. The moderator will be Professor Matthew Smith, head of the Department of History. And before we end, I'd just like to thank certain people. And that's the planning committee, Professor Matthew Smith, Sophia Preston from the principal's office, Kaden and Odin from uh, marketing, Ms. Petrine Curtis from the faculty of sport, the staff of MITS who've helped with the streaming and the, and the, um, the clickers, the High Commission of the Republic of South Africa, in particular Mr. Gunny and his staff, UETV, and the Faculty of Law, all of whom have made this possible, and thanks to everybody there. So, do we have some figures to show? This was, this was perhaps before, at the start of, 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 the, of the presentation. So 40% agreed and 60% disagreed. And at the end, is that correct? That seems to be what it is still. So no change in, in views. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> With that, ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to view the exhibition outside, or to, your, to my left as you go outside, put on by the Republic of South Africa with images from the Nelson, Monda uh, Nelson Mandela Foundation. And I think the bar and the refreshments will be reopened. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you to the debaters once again. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>